Hi, this is Surfer of Life and I'm your host Tommy. My guest today is a professional ice hockey goalie who built his own path from small hockey country Austria all the way to the big leagues. He was drafted by Philadelphia Flyers and played pretty much all over the globe during his career. He has also wrote a book about life in KHL, Continental Hockey League. And now at the moment he's a player agent and a coach and all kind of things. Bernd Brückler, welcome. Thanks, nice to be here with you. You come from Austria, from Graz, right? Correct. What was the beer festival called in Graz that the place is made out of hay? Can you remember that? It was called... Um, <laughs> good question. They don't have it any, no longer. Um, yeah, anyways, a fun fun place to go in the summer where lots of people get together and drink and listen to music. I don't remember. <laughs> anyways, anyways, good to have you here. Uh, today we're going to talk about ice hockey and uh, the whole situation in the sport and a little bit about your career and uh, also a lot of that mental part that it's very big issue in uh, especially as a goalie as you were so but I always like to start from the beginning yeah? so a little bit about your career and you come from Austria and ice hockey wasn't the biggest sport especially at the time when we were you were a young kid so how did it all start how did you become a goalie well I I started in the 80s I'm, I'm born in 81 so um, 36 years old now Um, when I started, uh, the big sport, and it's still the same, is soccer and, you know, skiing and these kinds of sports. And uh, I just was in kindergarten and got interested in skating and hockey and stuck with it. And uh, it was a good choice. So a lot of people, a lot of kids were playing football and you just got into hockey. And did you feel like that this is really your sport right at the beginning? Were you really focused on it or was no, it just was, a fun hobby at the beginning? I was a dual sport athlete, so I was playing soccer and hockey until I was about 13, 14 years old. It was a nice hobby at the beginning and then started getting more serious and more serious as we went. And my my parents didn't let me off the hook. They said, you know, you, you're you the goalie of the team. You have to be there at practice. So there was no shortcuts for me. Okay, so big support from family and a little bit also pressure maybe to yeah, put you in the net. A little bit. You moved to Canada pretty early, right? So what made you do that decision? I moved there because uh, mainly there's an end of the road for me in Austria as a hockey player. So I didn't want to go that route and I wanted to, you know, make it to the NHL and had the same dream that a lot of kids had. But... I really took it uh, very serious at an early age, mainly after I was first time in Canada playing in the big Pee Wee tournament in Quebec City. Over 100 teams, uh, 15,000 people watching 13-year-olds play. It really opened my eyes and I was like, okay, I have to go there and really carve my own path. Was this sort of the, like the trigger, the Pee Wee tournament for you that you decided that you want to be the guy who's playing in the big leagues? That was the trigger. Yeah, I would say that. What were your parents or your family thoughts when you moved to Canada? You were only 16. Yeah, I was I was young. And uh, certainly my mother still remembers the day that I left like yesterday. Um, it was tough for her. My father was a, a little bit more chill about it and really wanted me to go for it and live my own dream and kind of... Uh, make it over there but uh, my mother it was tough for her what about you what about the decision was it a tough decision for you to make no not really i i had made up my mind and it was clear that i was going to go there and basically give it all that i had and really go for it until i make it or or, or break doing it do you remember though see that that situation when you landed In the Canada, it was the biggest ice hockey country in the world, still is. And you're a young guy from Austria, and it's a strange language. Everything is new. Do you still remember that time when you? Of course, I I remember all those times very well. I, it was, it it made me who I am today. I mean, it's uh, very tough at that age to move abroad, and uh, it was good that I had 
good supporting cast, people that uh, were really helping me, housing family, billet family that I had there, you know, coaches along the way, different people. So it helped me a lot. Were you afraid of the new things? Were you excited, nervous? Did you find any of these? Probably all those feelings. Um, mostly probably excited to be there and just couldn't wait to get started and get in the net and really, you know, Uh, show what I got and um, it was definitely an uh, interesting experience right from the start. Did you have some methods or something that you used already early days that you were able to focus on the sport and kind of like face that fear and get over with it? I was probably still in the learning process of that at that age but uh, as a goaltender of course you have to block out everything and try to do the best you can to stay in the moment that counts for every athlete but um, it's even more so I think as a goaltender because if you get distracted just the split second the puck is in the net and if as a player you make a mistake there's still those layers that can back you up and it nothing sort of big happens as a result of it so And then when you're in the net, you're a goalie, you are a team player, but you are sort of a, an individual athlete in a team sport. Yeah. That's Any comments on that? That's true. I mean, that's how I see it also. And that's uh, why I liked it. I love playing in a team atmosphere and being in a team and just everything about it. I love, but uh, in there, you're, you're your own boss. I mean, if uh, you can really decide games, uh, probably more so than and field players and if one individual guy in a team can't really often take the game over and as a goaltender you can do that it's on you in canada it's a big it's the biggest sport still so as a teenager as a junior player were there spectators already up in the seats watching the games yeah there were and uh, mostly of course in in junior a the highest level But also in these midget uh, tournaments already and in these uh, really in junior B, junior A, that's where it starts. And it also opened my eyes. It's pretty special to play in front of fans, of course. You think it helped you out later when there was always spectators, a lot of spectators up in the seats watching your play? You think it helped you when it was right at the beginning also like that? Certainly helped that I had experienced it before, probably not in the level that, you know, later on in university when there's 15,000 fans and even more, but it helped already to have that kind of extra eyes on you. And it adds pressure also to do well in front of all these people. You mentioned all earlier already that you were in the developing spot uh, or you were just developing your mental focus and the mindset How did it happen? You were in the States for four years after that. Canada. How, how many years were you were in Canada? Um, I was in Canada for three years and uh, it was a little bit on and off because of different rules that, um, you know, a team was only allowed to have one import and maybe a team had an import already. So I was only a backup goaltender and so on. Um, but then moved on to States after that and uh, finished my high school degree there and then went on to university. But uh, it, it's uh, definitely the path that every step along the way sort of forms you as the athlete that you later on become. After university, what was the next step? I started my professional career in North America uh, in the farm team of the New York Rangers in Hartford, for the wolf pack it was a little bit of an eye-opening experience after being in college and very like close-knit atmosphere and guys are good friends and always backing each other up and you're not playing for money yet so it's a whole different uh, game than when you're in the pros and all of a sudden i'm there and guys are really backstabbing each other and really just doing anything they can to get to the top so A defenseman might not uh, care if he's minus five after the first three games, as long as he gets a few points. So it was it was eye opening. I didn't enjoy it that much uh, coming from college, but then the opportunity came to come to Finland, and I spent a little over three seasons uh, in Finland, and it 
it was the one of the best times I had in my career. If you back up a little bit, you got also drafted during that time when you started to play as a professional. How did it feel to get drafted? Yeah, the, my my draft, in fact, um, my draft years were before I went to university. So I got drafted uh, as a 19-year-old uh, to Philadelphia Flyers. Of course, it feels very special. I remember driving in the Austrian mountains and uh, being with my family and just spending a, a few weeks at home in the summer. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from Philadelphia Flyers GM saying that, hey, we're proud to have you part of this organization. And it's sort of surreal and uh, a very nice experience. But I never ended up playing in a flyer sweater. And uh, uh, they basically gave up the rights to sign me after a few years. And I ended up playing in Hartford. So so then you came to Finland. And you now you also live here in Finland. And you already mentioned that they were special years. How was Finland different to America? Uh, this is like... Hockey, it feels, is number one here. And, uh, of course, they also have Formula One and race car driving and other sports here, no question about it. But hockey has a big, big uh, part in this culture and people all live and breathe hockey and you could feel that. And it was very serious. The league was very good. Uh, we had success. It was just all in all very good years. Did you feel more part of the team here in Finland if you compare it to USA? Because... I know also from my experience that people just come and go, the players. And like you said, they don't even care if they have minus, if they made a couple of points by themselves, because they are maybe more thinking about themselves as a player and they want to go higher up. Was it same here in Finland or was it different? Now in Finland, what impressed me the most is that, uh, of course, this culture here is a little bit more introverted and people are... M- not as open as in North America. So what impressed me was that they were still so much ready to play and it was quiet in the locker room before a game and they were still so prepared and and so professional about it. And the game was played really hard here. I I was so impressed by the defensemen playing extremely hard in front of me, night in and night out, blocking shots every time. Uh, so very, very impressive. When individuals are doing the, those kind of things, they're blocking shots in the game, during the game. Does it help you out as a player also? Do you get light up when somebody does things like that or you just keep your same focus during the whole time as a goalie? Does it vary during the game? Of course, you try to keep the same focus, but uh, these instances, of course, lift you up. Uh, it helps that it shows you that your teammates care. They really put their, you know, face first into into shots like we said and it helps uh, it def- definitely gives me a lift every time you came to Finland and you already had played as a professional had you already developed some methods before the game when you, for the preparation did you have certain things that you always did before the game uh, yes uh, I think most athletes have some sort of routine that you develop and that you go with for me The biggest routine is just, uh, and that lasted until the end of my career, was just taking a pregame nap. That was the biggest thing. Coming home, eating a good lunch. It didn't have to be the same. I know some guys say they eat noodles every day. With how many games there are right now, I don't think you can eat noodles every day. So it's a bit too much, but it was for me anyways. And then uh, I just really needed my nap. And I'm I'm the kind of guy that uh, would go for a long nap. I mean, my naps were between an hour and a half and two hours long, just really feel rested afterwards. And then just kind of loosen up, maybe a short stretch, your warm up routine that was always the same. I did a dynamic warm up where I would loosen up and then get ready for the game. Did you have any magic socks or something that <laughs> old timers they did have some voodoo magical stuff before the game? How about you? <laughs> magic socks is not as bad as magic underwear. I've heard of guys having the same underwear or needing to wear the same underwear every game. That's that's a bit more strange. No, I didn't have anything like that. Uh, when I was a kid uh, growing up, I had some stuffed animal that I put on top of the net, I remember, but that was more, you know, you don't think about later on so yeah nothing nothing crazy 
I understand that you've always liked to practice hard, and that's been a big part of your game. Am I right? Yeah, I it was, and it got me to where I was able to go as a professional. So I, I really believe in that, and I think that was also formed in North America. Really instilled in me that you know you need to work hard every practice, every day, every minute of uh, the day, really, and put everything into the thought that it takes for you to get better to make it to the next level. So. You think that helps you out when preparing the games that you know that your basic standard is already high up? Does it help you to concentrate on the games? Does it kind of put away the fear or the of lack course. of self-confidence? D- there is a, there's one saying that it said in our locker room in Wisconsin, and I think it's very true. It said, from strength comes confidence. And I can speak from my own experience that when you practice well and when you practice hard, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's running, whether it's uh, on the ice, doesn't matter, you will feel good afterwards. And you will go into the game feeling confident about what you have done in preparation the previous three, four days or just one, two days. doesn't matter, but you will feel good about yourself. What do you think about the mental coaching, mental training versus physical training? Do you think they go hand in hand? If somebody, some of them, one of them is bad, the other one suffers also. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I don't know if there's a real correlation between the two, but I do know that there is a lack of, like, the... The mental training has not been as important for many people as it is the physical training. That's what I'm trying to say. It's physical training everybody talks about, but mental training sometimes gets forgotten. You think it should be more out there? Especially for professional athletes, it's a huge part. And uh, it has just somehow got forgotten. And it should get a little bit more attention, that's for sure. Okay, you stayed in Finland. What made you stay in Finland now after your hockey career? Well, I have a family and three children, and we live here in Finland, and it's uh, all in all a beautiful country. I I like it here. The quality of life is very high. People are nice. I have really enjoyed it. And with this job that I have now, I still get to travel a lot. We go back to Austria uh, several times a year, and... I get to see some hockey games, so it makes me not miss the game so much as a professional. You already signed here in Finland and you made some good contracts. Did it change you as a player or were you still that young kid uh, trying to be the best goalie? Or did it change your mentality at all when you know we're talking about bigger money, bigger contracts? How did it affect you? No, it didn't change me. Uh, I still wanted to be that person. But the only time that I felt there was some sort of change uh, and thoughts about the money and contracts and everything else was when my children were born. Uh, Then it gives you sort of a new perspective. And whereas before I was always very serious and I wouldn't talk to anyone if I had lost a game, you know, whether it was I had a great game or bad game or whatever, I wouldn't want to see anyone. I was kind of trying to deal with that on my own. And it took me sometimes, you know, anywhere between 12 to 24 hours to get over uh, a loss. And then it was coming home and seeing your children and the smile on the kids' faces. And that made everything a lot better and uh, sort of puts everything in a good relationship, in a good light. Made you understand that they are more in life than just that game. That's right. Okay. After Finland, you got even in the bigger leagues. You got the KHL, the Continental Hockey League in Russia, which is a big, huge league. How did it feel? Was it uh, easy to go there when you had a chance? It's definitely overwhelming at first. Uh, a big privilege to get the chance to play there since it's the second best league in the world. And at the time, many, many top players that are well known, even in North America, Yarmir Agar, Sergei Fedorov played in this league and it was uh, really 
a, a very, very nice experience right from the start, but definitely a bit uh, shocking as well because it has uh, things that you wouldn't expect in the West, uh, whether it's, you know, airplanes that are a bit below the standard or it's, uh, you know, rinks that are uh, slightly old and yeah, all kinds of different facets of the game come come to light in Russia. You mentioned already Yaromir Jager. How did it feel when you met him on the hallway? He's been, everybody knows Jaromir Jager, who's been following ice hockey, and he's been the big, big man and the big sco- goal scorer and the, like one of the biggest players. And then you are playing in the same league and you meet him in the hallway and he recognizes you, right? Um, yeah, well, you know, you play against each other on the ice, you shake each other's hand, of course, then he knew and I asked Jaromir, if he could get one of his teammates, a friend of mine. And I was just, I remember to this day that I was so impressed. There wasn't maybe a handful of other guys on his team that would stretch after the game or whatever. Everybody was backpacking their bags and getting ready to, you know, get on the plane and fly out and go to the next city. And he was doing squat jumps and working so hard, dripping sweat. And this guy, even at that time, was already uh, in his late 30s you know and working so extremely hard so i was so impressed by that but uh, that's obviously been a big part of his success in his career that he has worked so hard and probably been helping him out to play that long career as a very good hockey player okay life in khl you have also written a book a wrote a book that's a correct word of khl what made you do that Yeah, my uh, my book is called This is Russia. And it was just the idea of my agent at the time who told me that uh, go there and put a few notes together. And then I gave it some thought and he said, no, really, you should you know, do this. And then later on, maybe publish a book. I was like, book, I'm a hockey player. Like, no, uh, this didn't even cross my mind. But the more thought I gave it, I was like, okay, this would really be kind of cool. I was trying to go online and find some notes and articles and info about the league and Russia myself. And it wasn't really that easy to do. So then I was like, okay, I could really do something here. Nobody has really done this yet. And then I did it and it was a very rewarding experience. It was something different. It gave me a, a different perspective. It gave me a different experience writing that book. And it's cer- certainly something that I can cross off the bucket list. I read it and I, I, I really enjoyed reading it. It's a very good peek behind the curtains in KHL. You see, all you see are these great players and a lot of spectators and big paychecks, but Nobody really knows what's behind that curtain. So it was really overwhelming of reading that. So I highly recommend it for everybody. And it's you can get it from especially Amazon.com and yeah. in the bookstores. Uh, I will let the, the listeners to read your book so they will know then more about that Russian thing. But a couple of things I want to ask about the Russian. You mentioned in your book that uh, ice hockey players don't complain. We just shut up, try to cope with it, and play. Is this how it goes in ice hockey? Um, I think in Russia, this is how it goes. Russians, they know not to um, kind of open their mouth because they're worried about their jobs. They're worried about their future. They're worried about the the repercussions of if they would do that. Um, now, later in my career, I experienced that in Austria, not everybody just shuts up. So they actually speak out and they say if they're unhappy about whatever aspect of the game or practice or their team or they, they're they they're much different than uh, the people in Russia. So it's more like a culture difference, not the not part of the sport everywhere. A culture difference. Uh, Russians are also known to be real individuals and sometimes when they don't feel like playing, they don't really play. Am I right? That's true. And they're anyways a bit moody. They're they're artists with the puck. And if, you know, they're being played the body on or whatever, they're definitely then not in a 
in a mood to play, then maybe they don't show up that night. It could happen. Yeah. How did it affect you as a goalie when this happens during the game that you really see that the player doesn't give 100 percentage? I think it's less and less happening now. It it used to happen more probably because of guys were so one dimensional at one point. Uh, there, you know, you had your offensive stars, you had your defensive guys. Uh, the way the hockey's played right now, every guy on the team needs to be able to play offense and defense already, and uh, I don't think you see that so much anymore. When playing in Russia, you also got injured. How did it make you feel? What happened? I my first year in Russia, I tore my ACL, and it was certainly a bad injury. I happened to me during a game in Yekaterinburg and uh, towards the end of a game and uh, certainly a, a big blow to my expectations and uh, Russian career there in the first year but I was able to go to Austria have surgery with one of the top surgeons that uh, performs surgery on a lot of the skiers there and, and alpine athletes and he fixed my knee and I came back even stronger the next year so wasn't hard to get mentally focused or put your mind into that rehabilitation. No, it wasn't difficult because, um, of course, I had a two-year contract, so I was really hoping to do whatever I can in my power to come back strong and fulfill my contract there. It has happened before that guys got injured and they get kicked out immediately in Russia. So... Uh, I wasn't sure at that point, so it motivated me actually to work hard and perform and just really come back healthy and strong. In the games and during the season, sometimes it's it's sort of a roller coaster, coaster occasionally that sometimes the games just don't go well. How it affects you? What do you think happens when you're playing good and suddenly something happens and just doesn't? You just don't catch the puck like you should be. What happens? Is it the head, or is it the physical side that effect is affects most? I think it's probably both. Um, of course, we we know that our concentration goes down when we're tired, and when you play a lot, like in my second year in the KHL, I, I played the most minutes in the league, and it was uh, definitely a very very tough season. Especially then when you're fighting for playoffs and you're right in that uh, mix of working so hard to to make it and play in the postseason, your best games are needed, but you're already tired from a long year and a long training camp, preseason and so on. So it certainly also affects your mental side if you are tired physically. Yeah, I understand that. It's it's kind of like the whole system breaks down when you're mentally tired and then you're physically tired and the right. body just can't handle and the mind can't handle everything. Okay, like that was life in KHL. You were there three years, but then something you were supposed to play one more season, but it was just a short meeting and then it was all over. Yeah, what happened then? Um, well, I was fired uh, about one month in. Uh, into training camp or a little over one month in new coaches came uh, they had new expectations they weren't happy with what they saw uh, in training camp I guess and then just a quick hey can you come in the locker room in the coaches room hey we're gonna let you go talk to your agent they're gonna figure everything out we wish you all the best you're gonna be fine take care so it was that quick and All of a sudden, I was without a team. I was sitting there. I was having a hard time swallowing. <laughs> like this was a tough pill to get right before the season starts, and uh, it was also the lockout, so very tough to find a team at that time with a lot of NHL goaltenders coming over to Europe to play. So uh, it was a it was a tough test. How do you get back on track after that kind of decision? You need to play. You need to find a team. Did you just get right in the business? You tried to find a new team or how did you go? No, of course I wanted to. I felt like I'm a KHL goaltender. I wanted to play in Russia. I wanted to be there. However, it was certainly tough with uh, the lockout happening and uh, 
tough to refocus. Uh, it took a couple of weeks to be with the family and to kind of the kids lift me up again at that time. I'm 32 years old in the best years of my career at that time. So of course I want to play and play in a good level. But then there was nothing. So for a couple of months, I was forced to train, train hard and spent the time in Austria. And then came back uh, quite good with uh, Red Bull Salzburg, signed a contract there and uh, continued my career in Salzburg. Obviously, family is very important to you. You brought it up a couple of times here already. In Russia, you had your mask painted and there was this torpedo in Russian letters, but it almost said Opa. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about Opa? Yeah, Opa, he's uh, my grandpa. Uh, Opa means grandpa in German. And uh, so he was certainly a big part in my life growing up and when I was 20 years old my father passed away I was in states at the time and so my grandpa even took more of a father role on and uh, was visiting me in US and was visiting me in Finland was visiting me in Russia and everywhere so um, very honorable man and uh, one I learned a lot from you think family is very important when supporting you and now you have three kids You're going to be that dad who's going to support your kids, whatever they decide to do in their career as an athlete or something else. Certainly, that's who I want to be. I want to give them the opportunity to pursue whatever sport or dream that they have. And um, if it is hockey, great. If it's not, they'll find something else they're passionate about. That's perfectly fine. And uh, I certainly had good role models in my uh, life that I think I can take a lesson or two from them and hopefully instill that into my kids. I know we have a limited time today, so we got to soon wrap this up, but I have a couple of more questions for you. And what is the next next big thing for you? The big thing has been ice hockey and you're still working on ice hockey, right? But do you still have a, like a bigger plan, bigger picture in front of you? Let's say 10 years from now. What are you doing then? No, I think now I... It's so new, uh, being only away from the game for one season. I haven't played. That uh, I'm no different than other uh, than any other uh, professional athlete that's sort of trying to figure out life after the career and either find a new career or find a niche where you know you feel most comfortable. And right now, you have mentioned it, uh, it. It's been all about family. It's been spending time with my kids. It's been you know kind of stepping back uh, a little bit and watching from the outside. And also I got into the agency business. I'm working as a as an agent and it's uh, been a, a rewarding experience to work with a lot of good athletes and kind of mentor them and help them uh, carve their own path in their career. Okay. So one more question for you and then we are done. Uh, What makes you wake up in the morning? What is your passion at the moment? What makes you happy? Well, this seems to be the theme. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've said it, and and yeah. it goes back to this: the the kids they make me happy. I, they have they have a smile every day in the morning. It's like they're they're not tired at all. They're they're perfectly ready for their day and just excited to see you. And uh, uh, I love that. It's it's great to be here and see that and kind of, uh, you know, watch my daughter's first day in school and watch my, my sons, you know, either play hockey or floorball or soccer and just enjoy being outside and that kind of stuff. So, um, that excites me. And, and just the fact that, uh, I have more time for myself also with the game. And as a professional athlete, uh, you have very strict routines, So now it's kind of learning to work with your own routine and kind of carving your own schedule. I really appreciate that you are sharing this information with me and sharing a big part of your life. So I really, really do appreciate that you came here to talk to me. Or actually, I came to your place to talk to you. You gave me a place to talk to. And thank you so much for this interview. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, Brooks. Thank you very much. Take care.